everybody today all right let's stand to our feet this morning it's a beautiful day outside the sun shining out there the sun shining down on us here this morning and I just want to grab a little clip from Miss Diane's service this morning if she doesn't mind one thing that she said uh, when she would counsel with somebody she would give them an assignment and that assignment was to go up front to the altars during worship and give it to God and I'm going to challenge us this morning to do the same thing. The altars are open. Just whatever it is you're going through, just lay it down this morning. Give it to God and don't pick it back up again. Jesus died on that cross one time for us. He's not going to do it again. So let's just leave it there. Father God, just open up the heavens this morning. Just let your glory fall on us. We just give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. The glory on our face, looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens.
him praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that victory that we have in you, Father. That victory that we have only in you. Thank you, Jesus. The God I serve knows only how to try My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you.
from the inside out, Lord. Cleanse us from the inside out. You are worthy.
you are God and there is no one like you. We come this morning to worship you and to praise you and, and, and we thank you for the honor and the privilege that we have to be called your kids. Father, we praise you and we thank you for sending your son to die that we might live. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that is here with us, that is in us. We thank you, Father, for your representation on the earth, Father, that the church, Father, filled with the Holy Spirit, Father, would accomplish your will. Lord God, we're here this morning, Father, to be equipped by you. We need more of you. We need you to fill us up. Father, as we open our hearts to worship you, Father, I pray that you would impart yourself by your spirit on the inside of us, Father God, that we might be changed, that we might be powerful, Father, to accomplish your will on the face of the earth. We thank you, Father, that you chose us, Father. We thank you, Father, for, for this place, for these friends, for this family. We thank you for this praise team, Father, that has done their job, Father, to prepare our hearts for your word. We thank you, Father, that as we come into your presence, that you are mighty to save, that you want to deliver, that you hear our cries, Father, and that you answer our prayers, that you are working on our behalf, even when we can't see it. We know, God, that you are with us. We know that you're for us. Father, we just want you to be honored in this moment as we worship you together praise you. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You guys are awesome. We're, we're so blessed to have an anointed praise team. You know, we are, we are blessed. We're blessed among men and women, <laughs> among people. Hi, Pastor Rick. Mom, mom's taking care of Pastor Rick right now. Keep, keep close eye on him. We love you. I love you. I, I want to share with you why Pastor Rick isn't here. He um, had an accident on Wednesday night before church here at the church. You know, he's been uh, a Wednesday night. If you've been coming, you know that he's teaching us how to um, recognize the enemy. Right? and how to be prepared for the end times and the days that we live in. And um, I don't know, I think the devil didn't like it. And I'll be honest with I, I'm going to tell you the honest to God truth. This is what happened on Wednesday night. I'm going over here. Uh, you can follow me, right? Okay, so y'all have a desk chair at your house, right? It's got like six wheels, legs on it, feet, whatever you want to call them. Okay, Wednesday night, Pastor Rick was in his office Wednesday afternoon, and that chair, just, just like that, it split right down the middle. Three legs went that way, three legs went that way. And he bashed his head on the credenza in his office. He has a concussion and he has whiplash. So he's not here today, and I want you to keep him in your prayers. He's also caught a bit of a cold this weekend, so he's kind of miserable right now. I'm sorry, doll. I love you. And I want you to pray for him. I want you to keep him in, in your prayers. He's in the front line in this army. And you know what? The enemy, we have an enemy. You know that, right? He hates us. He hates Pastor Rick. But I am thankful that our God has made us victorious. Amen. And he gave us his word, and the word says, no weapon formed or fashioned against us has authority to prosper in our lives. And so we just rebuke that thing in the name of Jesus and call him healthy and whole and healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you agree with me on that? All right. Amen. Well, thank you. I am... Um, Happy to see all of you this morning. We had the 9 o'clock service, as you know, and uh, it went well. I forgot um, something, so I won't forget it this time, um, but I'm glad that you're here. Let's see. Oh, here's what I forgot in the last service. I forgot to talk to you about um, the offering. 
Now, you know that we all support the work of the ministry. I mean, we would not have a building if we did not. And so we're thankful. This is a, a giving church. We're thankful that you support the work of the ministry with tithes and offerings. And um, because of the restrictions that we have and social distancing and all that, we're not passing an offering basket, but we do have a a uh, place available back in the um, foyer there where you may give. There's envelopes, there's pens. We're going to ask if you haven't done so, if you would do that now because the counters would like to be counting during service. So um, thank you for supporting the work of the ministry. You know, it's something that we do because we love God and because we love his house, we love his church, we love his people, and we believe in the ministry of the church. Amen. And so I thank you for, um, for giving in that manner. So while you're doing that, I'm going to um, ask Sharon to come up here and talk about what's going on this week. Wednesday and Saturday. Okay. Oh, Wednesday night. First of all, I want to say how thankful I am to a church who believes in prayer. The word tells us this, that his house shall be called a house of prayer. And uh, so this week, we've got lots of prayer coming up. And Wednesday night, we're having a prayer service at church at 7 o'clock. And so I'm inviting you all to join us. Um, in that night, it's going to be a powerful, powerful evening. We're going to see God's hand move mightily. On Thursday, we're kicking off a 40 days of prayer. And there's a sign-up that Corey sent out to us, and so I hope you all signed up for a slot in there to uh, come alongside and pray. Uh, if you had trouble with that, um, let somebody know, let Corey know, or, or, or me. <laughs> yes, cause we want you to, to be a part of that. And then on um, Saturday, we are going to join with an event happening in Washington, D.C., and it's called The Return. And it's something that God put on uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn's heart to do. It's a world, it's a global event, actually. And we're going to join that event from Washington, D.C., live in this church in a simulcast. It starts at 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, there will be churches and Christians all over the world joining together uh, at the same time, with the same heart, with the same purpose, praying, repenting. Pastors told us so long now he's preached Second uh, Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Is that what we want? Yeah. He's told us how to do it. It's just if you will, if you will, will you join us? Will you be here? Saturday morning, uh, the doors are going to open at 8.30 so we can talk a little bit about what's going to go on through the day, and the simulcast starts sharp at 9 a.m., and I believe, and you believe with me, that God is going to turn this nation around. We will stand, and when we've done all to stand, we'll stand some more, and we'll believe that it will happen, but we need you, church. Rise up. No, more. You mentioned it in the first service. It's not any time to be a spectator anymore. We can't be a spectator and expect someone else to do it anymore. That didn't work. We've done it for years. It didn't work. We have to rise up. So I'm looking to see you come in this door Saturday morning, 9 a.m. it starts. Be here at 8.30. Amen. And the 40 days of prayer actually is, um, there are 40 days uh, starting on Thursday that are leading up to the um, national election. And so we just want you to be a part of that prayer coverage. Leading up to the election for 40 days, you can, um, we're calling you to fast and pray according to the Word of God, and you can fast whatever you want. We're not telling you how to do that. We're just asking you if you would get on board with the body of Christ. You know, Sharon mentioned uh, Second Chronicles 7.14, and it always reminds me of a message that Pastor Rick preached years ago about the if-thens in the Bible. Because we just think God's going to do what God's going to do, right? But there are so many times that God says, if you will, then I will. And so we have to do our part. And so I hope that you will 
um, link up with us in, in fasting and praying in the 40 days leading up to the election. And I hope that you'll come out on Saturday morning and take part in this national prayer service. And so you are invited to do that. I think we're going to have a children's ministry moment. Good morning, boys and girls. I have an awesome message that I want to share with you today, but I'm going to need all of your participation. So I'm going to teach you something from the Bible today that I want you to never forget, and you will live a blessed life in God. No, so I'm going to show you something, but I, I need you to stand up. Everybody stand up. Oh, you're not standing. Uh, over there. Stand up. Yep, everybody stand up. And because I want you to learn what we have here on the whiteboard behind me, okay? Are you ready? Now, you need to say this with me, okay? Are you ready? It says, believe and receive. <laughs> Doubt and do without. Let's say that again with me. I want everybody now, everybody together, stand up. Ready? Believe and receive. Doubt and do without. Man. Oh, I love Kit Kats. Mmm. Mmm. This is delicious. Break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. Woo! Yeah. All right, so I'll save that for a minute. Let's go through this one more time. Everybody together. Believe and receive. Doubt and go without. All right. Now, let's say that you need something in your life. Let's say maybe you need some money. You have some really big bills. Some really, really big bills. Say, I have some really, really big bills. And let's say maybe you need a hundred grand. Can we believe for a hundred grand? I think we can believe for a hundred grand. And after you hear the scripture I'm gonna read you, I know you can believe for a hundred grand. So, let's say it again. Are you ready? Believe and receive. Holy cow, look at that. A hundred grand, that's amazing. Wow! Well, what happens if we doubt? Doubt and do without. Believe and receive. Doubt and do without. Now here's that verse that I want to share with you. Are you ready? This is found in Matthew chapter 21. Starting in verse 18, it said, Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. S seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it and he found nothing on it except the leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again, he's speaking to the fig tree. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they thought? Hmm. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt. Did you hear that? If you had faith and do not doubt doubt if you have faith and you do not doubt he told his disciples not only can you do what was done to the fig tree but you also can say to this mountain go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done if you believe what was that if you believe, like you're believing for a hundred grand, 
If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. If you believe, you will receive. Are you believing today? You see, this belief is an action. It's something that you actively do. Believing it starts with a positive confession with your mouth. Are you making positive statements today? If you really believe that your house was on fire, certainly you would take action. You wouldn't just sit there and let it burn down around you. If you really believed that you were ill, you would probably go see the doctor. You would take action. So when I say believe is an action word, that means that we as believers need to act. We need to speak positive words and no words of disbelief, no words of doubt should ever come out of your mouth because if you doubt, you do without. Say it again. If you doubt, you do without. Everybody, if you doubt, you do without. But if you believe, you will receive. Have a great day. Thanks for coming. Amen. They do an awesome job back there. Well, I'm glad to see y'all this morning. I always got to take a minute just to look out there, see who's here. It's a lot of some people I haven't seen in a long time over here, some more people over there. It's good to see you guys today. I'm, I'm happy to be in God's house. Are you? I'm happy to be a part of the body of Christ and be a part of what God's doing on the face of the earth. Hi, Cindy. I, I text my friend, said, she told me, anytime you're preaching, let me know. So I hope you're out there, Cindy. Love you. <laughs> I have a word. You know, when Pastor Rick got hurt and he got a bad cold, and did I tell you he has whiplash and um, a concussion? And, uh, you know, they told him he's got to take it easy. He's not supposed to read or have screen time. And um, that's all he does. <laughs> he reads like, he reads all day long. And it, I guess it's something about straining your eyes, you know. And, and uh, so we're going on vacation today, this afternoon. And uh, as long somebody's going to help me get the camper hooked up. And then uh, I'm going to drive it. To, I've already had a discussion about when we get there. I think I'm just going to pull right in and then go to the camp office and tell them I didn't back it in. Nope, didn't. I'm just going to pull right in, and uh, then we're just going to um, poke a campfire for a couple weeks and throw, maybe throw a fishing line in and rest and relax, and I think it's just what we need, and it's what Pastor Rick needs. So keep us in your prayers. I, I'm believing that he is completely healed in Jesus' name, and um, so thank you. We, we need your prayers. And we will receive them. Pray for mom. She's going to be home with my sister. And uh, she'll be just fine. And so it'll be a good time. I actually am prepared. Oh, I started to tell you this and I lost my train of thought. You know, all of a sudden, uh, come to find out, I'm preaching today. And so I want you to know that I'm prayed up and I'm full of the word I didn't have to cram like last night. Oh, my gosh, what am I going to do, you know? <laughs> uh, and I want to exhort you in this because you are supposed to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. At a moment's notice, and somebody were to come up to you and say, I don't know, what do you believe? You need to be ready. You need to have your answer ready. And so we're supposed to be ready in season and out of season. For people like me or Jonathan or some of the others of you, you might get a call at any moment saying, you're up. And I hope that you're prayed up, that you're full of the word, that you're ready to go. And uh, 
So I've been praying for you. I've been praying that God would give me the word. I pray just like Jesus did. Give me the word that sustains the weary. And so God gave me a word. I hope that it will encourage you and um, build you up. So I always like to start with kind of a funny story. And something happened to me the other day that was uh, funny in my own head. Nine o'clock this morning, it feel kind of stupid. But, um, <laughs> but the other day, I was driving somebody else's car. And they had their radio station set on country music. I don't listen to country music. I li I've been listening to Christian music since like 1995, you know. So I haven't heard any of these country songs, but um, I didn't want to try to mess with it, you know, in somebody else's vehicle because, frankly, I, the way they make them nowadays, I don't know how to do it anyway. So I'm listening to country music, and this song came on by Keith Urban. You've probably heard it. I had never heard it before in my life. And the chorus said, everything I needed to know, I learned from John Cougar, John Deere, and John 316. <laughs> Have you heard that song? I was just like, I can't believe my ears. Wait a minute, wait a minute. John Cougar, John Deere, and John 316, I never would have put those three together in a category. And I got home and I, like, I had to get on YouTube, you know, and Google it. I mean, or listen to it. I want to see the lyrics. I'm like, what the heck did this guy come up with? And, of course, Keith Urban didn't write the song, but um, I, I was just laughing. I'm laughing. Country music makes me laugh. I mean, it, they tell stories, and that's interesting. I'll, I'll crank it up loud because I want to hear the story. But some of the stories, man, they're nuts. Makes you want to take a baseball bat. And, you know, I don't I know what to do if he cheats, you know. <laughs> um, and then Luke Bryant. Okay, I only know Luke Bryant from um, American Idol. But he, that guy, he's a party animal, isn't he? Did you know that? One margarita, two margarita, three margarita shot. I mean, as a former alcoholic, I could relate to that. But I'm thinking, he's at the beach, you know, on this floating dock, and they're drinking margaritas. All I got to say is a steady diet of this kind of music would, would drive me right to the bar. I'd have to get the blender out and make some margaritas. A steady diet of that would not be good for me. I, I don't think that I could listen to that kind of music. And I, I'm not dissing country music. It's not all like that. But here's what came to my mind. I don't think that I could listen to that kind of music for very long because it would get in me. Right? It would get in me. And it, it might start to influence my thoughts. But that's the thing about music. It gets in you, and it stays there. Now, I was, uh, a number of years ago, I was driving my, uh, I took my grandma up to her house in the UP. My mom is from Escanaba, and she, her parents lived there, her family lived there, and my grandma would come downstate to visit uh, her kids and her grandkids and whatnot, and every once in a while, I would drive her back home. And I volunteered to do that because I wanted my kids, I had two little girls, I wanted them to get to know their great grandma. And so, you know, hours in the car and uh, we would get to spend some time with great grandma that they wouldn't normally get. I also wanted to take them across the Mackinac Bridge because, you know, that's fun when you're a kid. And we crossed it, you know, numerous times every year when I was a kid because that's where my grandparents lived. But um, I remember coming back home and, you know, again, Emily and Erica were little. This was before um, Sirius XM. You, you were lucky. You just got whatever kind of radio station you could get, right? So we were coming back, uh, and we were, I don't know, south of the bridge, maybe around Traverse City kind of area or something. And we got, I found this radio station, um, and it was a classic rock station. And I was like, oh, my gosh, these are the songs of my youth, you know. I hadn't, I, like I said, I've been listening to Christian music since 1990. 
And uh, so, so this classic rock station comes on. And so, you know, I crank it up because I know all the songs. And I know the words to all the songs. They're in here. And I'm singing, and, and uh, all of a sudden I realize what these words are actually saying. And I'm like, why didn't I ever realize that's what they're talking about before? I, did, I know all the words are in me, but it never really registered what, it, what they were. And I had to shut that channel off because I didn't want my kids to hear that. that some of them songs were dirty. And I got these two little girls in the car, and I'm thinking, I know all the words. How come I never knew what they were talking about. It was all about sex or drugs or something. How come that never registered with me before? And yet, it's in me. Music gets in you and it stays. Those songs, they're still in me. Not too long ago, Linda, I was looking for you at 9 o'clock. I was listening to a radio station and I heard a song by George Harrison. Now, for all you children in the room... He was in a group called the Beatles, and they came from Liverpool, England in 1964. It was the British invasion, and um, George Harrison um, wrote this song called My Sweet Lord, and I heard it on the radio, and I'm singing it because I know all the words, and, and it goes, you know, my sweet Lord, hallelujah, oh, my Lord, hallelujah. Rick can't believe I'm singing um, I really want to know you. I really want to go with you. I really want to know you, Lord, but it takes so long, my Lord. Okay, so I'm singing, I'm singing. And then the next verse says, my sweet Lord, Hare Krishna. Oh, my Lord, Krishna, Krishna. And I'm singing, and then I went, oh, this ain't about Jesus. <laughs> This is actually about a Hindu God. How come I didn't know that? <laughs> it's in me. And, and, and I have the hardest time shutting that song up in my brain because it's in there. And it's a, it's a Hindu chant. It's a mantra about a Hindu God. I had a retail store. Back in 2003, we lived up in the Gladwin area, and I had a little, uh, I worked as an interior decorator, and I had a storefront. I sold home interior stuff, and um, I had the radio on all day, every day. And uh, a salesman came by to, he wanted to sell me a spot on the radio, sell me some ad time or whatever. And I was talking to him, and I said, you know what really surprises me is, um, uh, all these commercials for Ford trucks, and they're selling Ford trucks with Bob Seger songs. Now, Bob Seger, for all you children, was a Detroit rock and roller uh, who I loved, and I went to concerts, and, you know, I love Bob Seger growing up. These were the songs of my youth. And um, now they're selling trucks like a rock You've heard the commercial, right? Catchy little tune, like a rock. That's Bob Seger. That was a Bob Seger tune. And I said to this ad man, I said, you know, I, I can't believe you're selling trucks with Bob Seger songs. And he said, you know why, don't you? And I said, no, why? And he said, because it's people your age that are buying trucks nowadays. He said, you're attracted to that song. You're drawn to that. Yeah, it's in me. It's used for marketing. Do you know that um, <clears throat> we are marketed, what, the things that are in us, in the day that we live in now, I mean, you can have a conversation with a friend on Facebook about anything, and next thing you know, your news feed is flooded with ads for that thing, because the, you're, you're, you're profiled. You're being targeted by marketers based on what your preferences, what's in you. You ever seen that one um, picture somebody posted? It's like 1950, and everyone's sitting in the living room with an aluminum hat on their head, you know? I think they're trying to get better reception or something, but nowadays we do that just to keep 
them people out of our brains, right? <clears throat> well, I want to talk to you about what's in you. That's really what God laid on my heart today. What's in you? Because Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows out of it. So what is in you is going to come out. It's supposed to. Whether it's good or bad, if it's in you, it's going to come out. <clears throat> We're, but we are called to guard our, our hearts and our minds, to give careful thought to our ways, to guard our paths. <clears throat> Because what's in you is going to come out. And you have to be careful about what you allow in you. I remember being 14 years old and hearing a horrible, violent story about an attack on a woman. And that thing, what, that story was in me and it haunted me and it gave me nightmares and I battled and battled and battled to get it out. Because it planted fear. And it's so easy to take in information, data, music, all the things. But it is a much different journey to get it out. It's a battle to get some of those things out. So you need to be careful. You need to guard your hearts and your minds. Now, we were just at a conference the other day, and there was a guy there by the name of Johnny Varik, and you guys probably know him, some of you. He's from Grand Rapids, but he lives in Mexico. Him and his wife, Carla, have a, a, a global ministry. He's a powerful man of God, and he spoke to a group of leaders, pastors and leaders. The staff from the church went to that uh, conference last Tuesday, and he spoke to us about the church. And, uh, you know, he kept saying, we're it. We are it. You are it. I'm reading a book right now by, um, um, <clears throat> what's his name? Who? Rick Renner. There you go. Thank you. Just flew right out of my head, and I don't have a concussion. <laughs> it's just old age for me. But... Uh, <laughs> Rick Renner, I'm reading a book right now, and he is a <clears throat> powerful man of God. He lives in the former uh, Soviet Union. And in the introduction to his book, he talks about um, the game of tag, playing tag as a kid. And he, and I don't know, maybe they, didn't pl maybe they didn't play tag in Russia, but we did, right? So you know how the game of tag goes. Somebody's it, and then they tag you, and then you're it, and... And then you got to tag somebody else, and then they're it. Well, in the introduction to this book that I'm reading, Rick Renner says, Church, you're it. We've been tagged. We've been tagged for this time, this season, the last days of the church age. We've lived in the church age for all these years, but guess what? It's wrapping up, and you're it. And we have to all... Grab a hold of that and recognize there's not going to be another. We're it. You're it. I'm it. You're it. We've been tagged. And Johnny Verrican, when he talked about the church, again, he was talking to church leaders, but I, it's time for the church to all get on board. Not just leaders. You know, Paul said, by this time you ought to be mature, eat meat, but you're still drinking milk. Okay, it, the days of playing church are done now. They're over. It's time to be serious about this. We are the church. 2,000 years ago, you read your Bible, Jesus came to the earth, right? God sent him because we needed salvation. We needed a redeemer. God sent Jesus. He came to this earth. He started his ministry at 30. He walked the earth the church people rejected him. They killed him. God raised him from the dead. <clears throat> he came back to his disciples. He came back for all of us. He died that we might live. But he met up with his disciples and he told them, go and wait for the Holy Spirit. God's going to send his spirit. It's gonna, he's going to live inside of you and you are going to begin 
the church, the church age. Jesus started it. It's still going on. That church in the book of Acts, still going on. We're it. Don't look around for somebody else who's going to do this. You're it. I think it's exciting to think about that thing which began in this. All those years ago, it began in this. Well, it be, you know, they wrote this, so we'd know. We're, 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 it's still going on, and we're it. It's us. So it's time for all of us to be church leaders. It's time for all of us to be mature, right? And Johnny Varekin said a few things to these church leaders. He said, number one, why should a person set aside his own aspirations? Well, because we're the church. Why should a person live beneath their means? You might be thinking, what? Because we're the church. Why should a person leave their comforts? Because why should we adjust, pivot, change, innovate? Because we're the church. There's not going to be another one. I mean, there are churches all around. The church, you understand, is not this building. It's you and you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and me. We're the church. People aren't going to come flooding into this building because the building is going to attract them or save them. Right? We're the church. And our time is now. We're it. So I ask you today, what's in you? Because what's in you is going to flow out of you. And there ought to be some good things flowing out of you because... You're the church, right? So, you know, when Johnny said, why should a person leave their own aspirations? Now, you may, that may seem foreign to you, but it's not foreign to me because I remember, I remember the day that Rick and I were driving down the road in my old Chevy van, and we decided to give our lives 100% to the work of the ministry, and in that moment, we said, well, it may not look like the best idea for the Lopez family, but it's the best thing for the kingdom. And, you know, we put the kingdom of God ahead of our own aspirations. We took a ginormous cut in pay to go into the ministry because it wasn't about our hopes and dreams. I, listen, I could have been a lot of things. Pastor Rick could have been a lot of things, but we laid that down. We gave up our hopes and our dreams and our aspirations. I remember being a, a 18, 19 years old, you know, out of high school trying to figure out, what am I supposed to do with my life? I don't know. I don't know. I wish that I had known that I didn't have to have it all figured out, that God had given me gifts and talents and that he'd promised to order my steps and that he would open the right doors and close the wrong ones and he would show me where to go and what to do. I didn't know that. I wished I'd have known that. That my job, actually, is just to stay close enough to him so that I can hear him speak, so that I will hear him say, this is the way, walk in it. Right? I wish that I had waited till I was 30 years old to lay down my hopes and dreams and aspirations. And, you know, when we, the church that we pastored up north had, uh, it had steps like this, there were like, three of them, I think, going all the way across. And I'll tell you what, that was the altar. And when the, when the worship team led us into the presence of God, our hearts were open to him, and he moved in us. And, he, and, and you know, we would go to the altar, and we would kneel down, and we would deal with our stuff. I've been trying to get people to deal with their stuff for 20 years, and some people just never will. It's unfortunate because Jesus died so you didn't have to carry that junk, you know, and I'd go up to the altar and, you know, I mean, I, there, from 30 to 60, do you know I had a few problems? <laughs> 
And I, and I would go up there, and I love you, but I would spend all week talking to God about what's going on in my life, in my marriage, with my kids, in my head, in my heart, with my family, all this stuff. And then when the worship team would usher me into the presence of God and my heart was open before him, I would go up to the altar and I would dump my stuff. And I wasn't worried about, does these pants make my butt look big from the back? I wasn't worried about what you were thinking of me. I wasn't worried about if you were going, oh, Diane's up there. Something, she must be in sin. Something's wrong. I don't care what you think. Because when me and God are dealing with something that I got to get free from, it's about me and him. I wish that, and I, and you know, maybe you don't feel this way, but if you do, please, please get over it and deal with your stuff. I would go up there and I knew, sometimes I knew my shoulders were shaking because I was sobbing. But I would dump my stuff at the feet of Jesus and I would get up lighter, freer. I, d I just would trust him. I can't carry this. You're not supposed to. And I'd let him carry it. I would leave it there and I would get up. That's what... Uh, our brother made reference to this morning. I wish that you would. I wish that you would take your burdens to the Lord and drop them. And routinely I would go up there when I would catch myself making plans for myself again. I would go up to the altar and I would say, Lord, everything I am and all I ever hope to be, I lay it at your feet. I want what you want. Not my will, but your will be done. That's called dying to yourself. And we're all supposed to do that. And you know what the really cool thing is? Because God has promised. This was not my motivation, though. I want you to know that. But God has promised to give us the desires of our heart. And so there were things that, yeah, I desired. But I would lay them down. And some of those things he gave me. Because he wants to give you the desires of your heart. He wants to. We try to build it all for ourselves. And I'm telling you right now, I promise you that you can never build a life like God could give you. You can strive and struggle your whole life and you won't have what God could give you. If you would just die to yourself and let him be the one that gives it to you. You know, one of the things in this book that I'm reading by Rick Renner, he talks about signs of end times. One of the signs of end times is narcissism. Do you know what that is? It's an infatuation with yourself. It's all about me. The Holy Spirit predicted that in the last days there would be an epidemic of narcissism. In 2 Timothy 3 and 2, it says, In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. The Holy Spirit depicts a society that is self-focused, self-centered, self-absorbed, and self-consumed. But it's unfortunate. You know, Rick Renner, he dissects every word and explains the Hebrew and the Greek, and it's very laborious and deep, but so eye-opening. He talks about this kind of love. It's almost a romantic love. It's like a romantic love. That's how much I love myself. If I'm a narcissist, I am just in love with myself. If I'm a narcissist, that runs rampant in the last days. But we are the church. It should not be said of us. Johnny Varekin said, why should a person live beneath their means? You might think, what? I spend all the money I get. Well, if you are a wise financial steward, you will spend less than you have so that you will have an excess. And the Bible says that, that we should give to every good work. Now, I remember, I've seen people like this. There's some in every church that have been wise financial stewards, and, and they don't spend every dollar that they get on themselves. 
and they are able to sow into other people's lives. I remember it was always, seems like, always the same people. They, I remember somebody up north, their dryer broke. Maybe it was a washer, one of those two. And, it, and the, this couple, they heard it through the grapevine somehow, and they came to Pastor Rick and I and said, we don't want them to know, but we're going to buy them a new appliance. And we need their address because we're going to drop it off at their house where they're at work. We don't want them to know. We just want to give. We want to meet their need. And I remember thinking, God, I want to be like that. I want to be a giver. Make me a giver. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't a giver. Rick, Pastor Rick was really not a giver. He, you know, I had, he married a restaurant manager and he gave every waitress a dollar. Didn't matter how much the meal was, here's your dollar. Be blessed, you know. I, I taught him how that works, but I, uh, I wanted to be a giver. I was not a giver. I was not a giver mostly because I didn't have enough even to pay my own bills. And there were things that I wanted and things that I needed. And, and I wasn't a giver, but I wanted to be. And I prayed all the time, God, make me a giver, make me a giver. Maybe I was a little bit selfish because I knew from the Word of God that he would give seed to the sower. And I'd heard that if he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. <laughs> That's not actually scripture, but it's good. And I thought, you know what? I want to be a giver. Make me a giver. And I'm, I'm pushing this because if you're not a giver, okay, fine. Ask God to make you one. You know what? I didn't even realize because I took my eyes off it that he had done the work. Until just recently when somebody sat down at my kitchen table and said to me, you are the most generous person that I have ever met in my life. And I was like, oh, me? <laughs> I didn't do that, you know, um, out loud, but I was thinking it, you know, me? I am a generous person? Oh, my gosh. I didn't. I'd taken my eyes off that. But God did the work. He made me a giver. So, why should a person live beneath their means so that they can help others? Because we're the church. Who else is going to do it? Who else is going to do the church's job if the church don't do it? You know who? Nobody. That's who. We're the church. We're supposed to be different. There's supposed to be something different about us. Why would a person leave their comforts? You know what I learned? God is not concerned with my comfort zone. Right? You get so comfortable, God's like, get up out of that chair now. He is not concerned with your comfort zone. I saw God take a whole church and shake it up because we were all content and comfortable. We were going to just stay and sit. We're a bunch of mature Christians. And he shook us all up. And he sent us all out in various directions. Because we're not called to stay and sit. We're called to go and do. Right? Why should we adjust, pivot, innovate, change? Why should we do any of those things? Because we're the church. We have to do. We have to meet the need. We have to go where there's needs. We have to help where, where people need help. You know, the church in the very beginning, if you go back to the, to the book of Acts, you'll see that when those uh, disciples started the church, they, um, they all stayed together and they had everything in common. The Bible says that they sold their possessions. If, if they had a house or a field, they sold it and they brought the money in and, and laid it at the disciples' feet and said, give, give to the need. Help where there needs to be help. We don't do that. We don't live that way. None of us have sold our house and our possessions so that we can help others. But that's, that was the beginning of the church age. I'm not here to beat you up today. I want to encourage you. But that's how the church started. I saw a sister on Facebook ask for days 
could somebody drive me to the grocery store because my car is broke? And from what I can tell, there was no response. That shouldn't happen in the church. I also talked with a sister not too long ago who in one of the, one of the most troublesome times of her entire life, she called on the church for help, and the people said, yes, we will help. And then nobody showed up. Nobody. How does that happen? We have to do better than that. We can do better than that. We have to do better than that. We're the church. I'm talking to you today about what's in you. Do you have a desire to help others? You know, we say the world needs us. The world needs us. But you know what? We need each other. We need each other. These two situations I just told you, they were in the church, in our church. We need each other. I need your help. I got to hook up a camper. And I've never been allowed to touch any of that stuff. I'm not even allowed to run the lawnmower <laughs> because I might break it. Because I don't know how, because I don't have to, because that's not my job. But you know what? Sometimes we need help, don't we? I know a lady, young gal with five kids, single mom. She needs help some days. There, you know what, there are, we could go around and we could make a list a mile long of what we could do to help one another. And I just, I'm not here to beat you up again. I'm just here to say we need to help each other. We're the church. And so I'm asking you, what's in you? You know, I, I, I was praying, you know, in this whole COVID thing, happened I was praying God help me or use me use me use me God and and you know the Holy Spirit brought to mind my neighbor who is a recent widow and and I was like okay okay and then I did nothing and then he said and then I'm praying use me use me you know and then I felt that prompting again and then I was like well you know they never answered their door and um uh, as I'm continuing to pray. I'm just telling to myself, so you know, I'm not just poking my finger at you. I'm like, God, use me. And he said, <laughs> by the Holy Spirit, I can't even get you to go to the neighbors. <laughs> so I ran right over there, and she wouldn't answer the door. So I ran back home, got a piece of paper and a pencil, and I wrote her a big long note, gave her my phone number, stuck it in the door, and then I went back a day later. The note was gone, so I know somebody peeked out, got the note. And, um, you know, she eventually did call me. But we've got to do better. I say we. I mean all of us. Because we're the church. And we're it. So what's in you? Is it fear? Oh, my gosh, where did the time go? I'm almost done. Is it fear? Is it fear that's in you? Because right now we're divided, the fearful against the not fearful. Some people are afraid, and some people are like, don't be an idiot. You don't need to be afraid. I just said that again. Did I tell them that this group that story? Or was it the last group? Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're divided amongst the fearful. Who's fearful? Who's not fearful, right? And, and it's really unfortunate because it's happening in the church. We're just as divided as the world. We think people who are afraid are just ignorant. But I submit to you, if you woke up this morning with a 102 degree temperature and a sore throat and a cough and every cell in your body hurt, would you be scared then? Would you be thinking, oh, my gosh, maybe I got the Rona? 
then, then it's a whole different thing. Then all of a sudden, we ain't talking about mass anymore. Now fear rises up, right? I want to combat, I want to, I want to teach you how to combat that. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's the same God we're serving today as the same God we served last year and the year before and 10 years ago. He's not afraid. He's not broken. He's not left. He's not missing out on, oh, my gosh, all this is happening, God. Why aren't you doing something? Well, he did send the church. Same God. Same God. If you get afraid, I want you to remember who God is. Same God. He, he was the healer before. He's still the healer, right? You're, you were, you're his kid. You were his kid last year. You're still his kid this year. Maybe you haven't heard from him lately, but he hadn't left. He's still God. He still has you. He's still going to give you the victory. We have to remember that. And, and we have to, you know, stop fighting with each other. You know, I, I, uh, I can't watch the news very long because it makes me angry. And I talk to the TV. I holler at the TV all the time. I, I'm like, you know, my mom, will, she'll lift off her headphones and go, are you talking to me? Nope, just hollering at the TV. Because the TV, the news makes me angry, and, 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 and politics makes me angry. And there are things out there that can make you fearful. But it's the same God. So it's in you. Are you full of the word? Are you full of faith? You know, faith without works is dead. So you can be full of faith and still just sit there and do nothing. You gotta, we have to, we're the church. We gotta act out our faith by the things that we say and the things that we do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you a scripture for fear, to combat fear. I taught this to my girls when they were little. And uh, um, in Proverbs chapter 3, if you have little kids, teach this to your little kids. Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to start with verse 21. And it reads like this. Well, it says my son, but I always read it my daughters because I was reading it to two little girls. Preserve sound judgment and discernment. They didn't understand that, so I would teach them, you know what, uh, learn the difference between right and wrong. There is a difference. And choose right. That's wisdom. Don't let wisdom out of your sight. This verse says, it will be an ornament to grace your neck. Now, because I had two little girls, I'd tell them, it's like a pretty necklace. You wear it. You put it on. Wisdom, you put it on, and it looks good on you. Verse 23, then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. You know, when I was a kid, I, my bedroom door was right across the hall from the front door. And I always used to worry that somebody was going to break in the house and they were going to get me first. Because, <laughs> you know, kids worry about things like that. I didn't want my kids to worry about things like that. I wanted them to lie down and not be afraid. It goes on to say, when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. And here's one. Here's one for all of you, all of us. Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be your confidence and he will keep your foot from being snared. You know, the, the word, when you have a, it is written in your heart, when you have the word in you, remember what's in you is going to flow out. When fear comes and you have the word in you, it's going to flow out. Not only will it help you, but it will help those around you. Last scripture is Philippians 4 and 6 through 7. Y'all know this. It's very common. 
It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, thanking God, thank you, thank you, Jesus, that you hear my prayer, that you're going to attend to it, that you haven't left me, that I'm not too bad or too sad. Or Thank you for hearing my prayer and petition and present your request to God. And then the peace of God that transcends understanding. It's like it doesn't make sense, but you're at peace. It will guard your heart and your mind with Christ Jesus. Your heart and your mind will be guarded with the peace of God. There is no better guard. If that's in you, it's going to come out of you. There's a scripture that says, if the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? But you are the light of the world, right? A city on a hill that can't be hidden. Have you ever flown into a big city and when you come down out of the clouds at night, you see that city and the lights of that city? That's the church. The light of the world is Jesus, but he lives in you now. Now, now is your hour. Tag, you're it. We're it. And you know what? You don't have to know everything. You just, you just have to know something. The, the thing that is so cool about the word is that if it's in you, it'll rise up. And you don't have to know everything. Uh, you know, I remember, um, I remember being called upon for something, thinking, I don't know everything, but I know some things. And you'd be amazed at how God will use you, how the word, the word will rise up out of you, and you'll be able to minister peace, love, joy. Maybe God will call on you to be provision for somebody. Maybe he'll ask you to give up your hopes and your dreams and let him order your steps. And I promise you, he's going to do a better job than you could ever do all on your own anyway. So don't let fear stop you. Do it afraid if you have to. You know, uh, there was a gal that I worked with that was just diagnosed with cancer, and I wanted to go. Now, if one of you were in the hospital, she was going to have surgery. If it was one of you, I would have gone to the hospital, or Pastor Rick would have gone, or we'd have gone together, and we'd have, we would have anointed you with oil, and we'd have prayed over you, and we would have believed for you. But, um, well, number one, I couldn't have gotten into the hospital at that point in time because of the COVID thing. But um, I, it would have freaked her out anyway if we'd have showed up. But, um, I saw her at work, and I said, hey, I want to pray for you. And I went, there are a couple other Christians in the room. I went and got them, and I said, can we, can we pray for you? And she, she said, okay. You know, and I anointed her with oil, and I laid hands on her, and I prayed, God, let it be according to my faith. I, I didn't used to know if that was a possibility. I remember my dad was sick. I wanted him to be prayed because I had faith for it, and I didn't know if that would work because it doesn't have to be his faith. But, you know, I've discovered in the Word that there were instances where people came to Jesus and said, my servant is sick. I have faith for you to heal him. Would you heal my servant? And Jesus did on the faith of the centurion, on the faith of that one. So I prayed, Father, let it be according to my faith. Heal her body. I laid hands on her. I prayed over her. And I I wasn't scared because I'm not shy. But you might have been scared. But I want you to do it afraid. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Because we're the church. We're the answer. We have the answer. Jesus is the answer. But we carry him. We're the church. Amen? Okay, why don't you stand to your feet and I will release you. I'm sorry that it's 1230. I don't know how that happened. (laughs) I don't know how that happened, Pastor Rick. (laughs) I promise I was right on time for the first service. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity. Father, I thank you for the privilege and the honor that it is to be the church. We're your kids, God. We're your kids. And Father, we love you with our whole hearts. We want to do your will. We want your will to be accomplished on the face of the earth. And, and Father, the, the world needs us, but we need each other too. Father, I pray now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would anoint us to rise up, to lay fear aside, to give up our own agendas, Father, to trust you for the future, to lay aside the fear, to stop the judgment. Father, I pray that you would anoint us to do the work of the ministry in this last season of the church age. You've called us for this time. You chose us. You've equipped us. You've anointed us. Father, I pray, I call up that equipment to rise up on the inside of each and every believer. The gifts and the talents that you've given them. Father, let that equipment rise up and cause them, Father, to lay aside fear and timidity and to do the work, Father, that's necessary on the face of the earth, Father, in this time, in this season. We thank you, Father, that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You haven't changed. You haven't stopped healing. You haven't stopped helping. You haven't stopped delivering. You're not surprised. You're not afraid. Hello. Is that you, God? We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your day. We love you.